I'm obsessed with systems. That's because I'm a believer in systems. I'm a believer in delegation. I'm a believer in empowering people, a believer in incentivizing people. I'm a believer in culture. And all I'm really doing right now is breaking down facets of business, right? Starting a business requires the most knowledge. So franchise, I think, is the easiest entry point for anyone that want to be an entrepreneur. So I look at that first decade and I basically really walked away with nothing except for a lot of lessons. I value the lesson more than the money. My money goes towards three things. It's never for savings. The second is delegation. And then number three, money is for creating life's most precious memories. What you really want is to use money for creating life's most perfect memories, for living a life well lived, living a life where you got to do everything that you really wanted to. So in this episode, I sit down with a titan in the world of real estate, business, and social media. Chris has transacted over $3 billion in real estate and almost 6,000 deals with almost 600 thousand followers on Instagram and just shy of a million followers on YouTube. When Chris talks, people listen. He flies around the country in his private jet with his family and says he buys one house a day, sometimes even two or three. Now with all that he's got going on, he's recently diversified into franchising. So I wanted to know why. Why get into franchising and what franchises is he involved in? Now, Chris is crazy passionate about building machines and business that can run without you. So he leans on business partnerships to do that, so much so that he's involved with a whopping 400 companies. Are you curious to how he pulls that off? Then definitely stick around to find out. So let's learn together from Chris on how you can build a machine that creates generational wealth for you and your family for lifetimes to come. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the episode. All right, welcome to another episode of the Franchise Empire Show. I'm here with a legend, the 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 man, the myth, um, Chris. Thanks for joining me. Awesome, Tarek. Glad to hear. Uh, glad to be here today and just launch into everything that we're going to be talking about. Yeah, cool, man. So you've done over two billion dollars in real estate transactions, six thousand deals. I heard yeah. you say on another podcast that you have a whopping four hundred companies. Yes. Um, so g- give us a breakdown of what your just overall portfolio looks like these days. Y- you know, um, I buy a house every single day and sometimes two and sometimes three, and it's a machine, right? Um, this whole idea of building something and then, um, needing to put the same effort into it and repeating it to get something new out of it drives me crazy. What I like to do is build a machine that builds a machine that builds machines. So um, that means that in my world, I've got a, an incredible group of executives. I've got an incredible think tank of, of just brilliant minds. And um, they, I, I kind of pluck them from all these different business industries. And I basically say, hey, we don't buy a company and then build a company and exit a company. What we do is we buy companies. We already are training the people that are going to staff and CEO those companies. And those companies should be giving birth to more companies uh, mm-hmm. because over the next decade, I'd like to own 10,000 companies. Wow. Wow. That's, that's, it. that's incredible. So buy a house every day. So how, how do you, how do you pull that off? You know, um, when I was a college kid, like a whole long time ago, I, um, I had gotten married early. My wife and I, we've been married for 21 years. We have four kids. And um, when we first got married, my wife read me my rights. She basically said, Chris, you're the man, right? We come from a little bit of a conservative background. She's like, I don't want to work. Don't ask me to work. Um, even though we're college kids, I'm focusing on college. And I expect you to make like figure out the money game. So that meant that while her parents were paying for her college, my parents didn't have the money to do that for me. So I had to put myself through college, which meant I also had to get a job if I didn't want to go into debt. And she reminded me that even though we both could have gotten jobs, she wasn't up to that. And she was going to be baby making, although years down the road. And, uh, you know, I remember having like my pity party party moment. I, I, Tariq, I was just pissed that I was like born in a day and age where I was the one that had to sell my soul for the next 40, 50 years to a job that I was likely going to hate. Mm. And so I said, well, if that's the case, then I'm going to get this done so fast that by the time I'm done with college, I'm never going to have to work again. And so I had three mentors that had each made over $10 million in real estate. And I said, show me how to do it. And uh, they did. And we fought, we battled, we debated, we argued. And I kind of found my niche, my strategy. And I basically figured out that if I could buy like a really entry-level single family home, and I would do this lease with an option to buy on it, 
And the family would give me t- on average a positive cash flow on that property of 500 plus dollars a month. But by, by the time I was done with college and had 25 of them at $500 a piece, I literally had $12,500 of positive cash flow every month. So when all my buddies were graduating with me and had to go start their careers, I was ending mine and I was done. I quit my job. And I thought that's what I wanted, by, by the way, b- way back then. I just literally ended college and retired for six months and didn't work. That's incredible. And yeah, I, I, I heard that, that you had 25 properties by the time you, you graduated college, which is in an, in an, it's an insane number. Um, so you're, here's, here's one of the reasons I'm, I'm really excited for our conversation is that I think there's a, 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 a debate that's starting to merge out there, which mm-hmm. is, you know, should you buy real estate? Should you buy a business? Should you buy a franchise? It's for a lot of people, it's kind of this one or the other, them pitting them against each other. And, you know, you're one of the few big names out there that are actually talking about franchises, own franchises, et cetera. And, you know, for me, a little bit about kind of my story was I kept trying to start business after business after business. I was a financial advisor, had my investment licenses, had nine failed businesses that I tried to start on my own, just yeah. couldn't seem to figure it out. Yeah. And within the first year of our first franchise, we did over $470,000 in sales profitable in the first two months. And I thought, wow, this is cool. This yeah. whole having a system thing. So how how long ago did you get introduced to franchising and, and what made you start to allocate some of your time and energy towards that? So I've really only been in the franchise game for the last couple of years. And it's my obsession with this, with, uh, I'm, I'm obsessed with systems online. They think, Oh, Chris Crone's a real estate guy. I'm like, I'm not a real estate guy. I don't spend one hour a month on real estate. How could I be a real estate guy if it doesn't get any of my time? Well, that's because I'm a believer in systems. I'm a believer in delegation. I'm a believer in empowering people. Um, I'm uh, a believer in, in uh, incentivizing people. I'm a believer in culture. And all I'm really doing right now is breaking down facets of business, right? And when you take a look at a franchise and ask, why are they 92% chance of success rate compared to a normal business? It's because people don't tell you that the, there are these three basic notions around, uh, around business. You can either start a business, you can buy an existing business, or you can buy a franchise. That's it. There's only three options. Let's look at success rates. If you start a business from scratch and you've never done that before, you could have nine of them and have all nine of them fail. And it's not that you suck. It's that there is, of all three options, guess which one of them requires the most knowledge? Starting a business requires the most knowledge. And most people don't get that. They think that that's the easiest one to start. I'm like, that is the that is the hardest game to play. Buying an existing business is a whole lot easier. Some dude built that thing 20 years ago, has systems, people, operators, track records, culture, everything. Like the sure shot on buying a business where you can look at its financials through history, like there's so much data and knowns. That's way safer than starting a business. But most people think, well, yeah, but I can start a business for free. That must be, that must make it smarter than buying a business. I'm like, well, who said that you ever had to pay money for a business anyway? I don't, I don't believe in that all the time either, but we won't talk about leverage buyouts and some of the fun games there. And then there's franchise. And of the three, franchise is by far the easiest because franchise was designed to be someone's business in a box. Someone started a business, hardest thing ever. Then they had to innovate and create and discover systems. And eventually they said, you know, this thing is doing so well. Let's start a second location. Let's start a ninth location. And at some point, they're years into the game. They have a handful of locations that are saying, man, this deserves to be everywhere in the world, but there's a problem at the rate we're scaling. Like we could do this our entire life and, and, and like just open a region like the southeastern quadrant. We, we would never get it out in the world. So franchises where they say, that's it. We're going to give it to people that want to buy into the game and they're going to pay us a royalty. And most people don't start a franchise until they've figured out the game, which means they've got, they've got financials, they've got data points and they've got marketing data and information, something that you have the opposite of when you have an idea called let's start a business. And so franchise, I think is the easiest entry point for anyone that says, you know, I think I want to be an entrepreneur. And I'm like, cool, buy a franchise. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. I, I, I feel like it's the easiest way to get the first win under your belt. Like if you want to go start your own business afterwards, do it. Great. Have at it. Have 400 companies like Chris, which I want to <laughs> dive into more later. But um, 
I, I feel like it's get a kind of get that guaranteed win under your belt with the system, with the franchise, and then go out and kind of do your own thing. What's interesting is uh, last week I interviewed a guy on the podcast who uh, we've done some work together, but he helps people franchise their business. And we were talking about how some of these franchisors are getting sold for getting bought and acquired for a hundred million plus yeah. after they build it out and have a couple hundred franchisees. So yeah. what's an interesting part of the conversation, I think, is not just the buying a franchise, being a franchise owner, but hey, if you're a great entrepreneur, go franchise your business in yeah. scale. Yes. Right? Yeah, yeah. Because a lot of people, um, you know, Tarek, if you look at it, um, at first, when we start a business or we buy a business, it's because we're looking for cash flow. We're really just saying, I'm still a single, I'm not an empire minded. I'm single income source minded. I don't want to be W2 because someone's going to have, you know, they're going to control my life. They're going to tell me what holidays I can and can't work. They're going to tell me when to show up, when to leave. And I don't like that lack of flexibility. So maybe if I'm an entrepreneur, it'll be better. And sure enough, there's a ton of entrepreneurs there. They're like, yeah, when I was W2, I got paid 70,000 a year or 170,000 a year, but owning my own business, I can make a quarter million dollars a year, or I can make more like the potential is so much bigger. Um, and all they're doing is jumping from one income to another income with hopefully more freedom, with hopefully more money. Uh, but at some point, you stop looking at business as a cash flow game and you start saying, wait a second, what does exit mean? Because most people don't start with exit on their first business or even their third business. Mm. And an exit means that I'm intentionally leveraging a strategy of building a company where I'm looking for building um, value so that when I sell it, I'm going to get a really huge payday. For example, five years ago, I didn't own a single company in technology and I was terrified to own a software company. And the first run that I had at it, I'm going to tell you, it was not easy. I literally just went into it because I needed to like break ground in that space. Today, one of my tech companies, it's a fintech company. It has, um, it has a 47 X multiple on its revenue. And wow. that, that company is growing like crazy. Like that company has the chance to be more valuable than all of my companies combined. And by the way, that happened by way of iteration, but it also happened. It, iteration means that the more you do this, the smarter you get at like picking all the variables. Well, I did this company for a number of reasons, but one of them, in addition to creating value in the world that didn't exist was exit potential. And exit is when you start saying, Hey, how do I build exit? Well, in most cases, exit is a function of revenue and EBITDA. Well, how do you get more revenue? You franchise and have a hundred people simultaneously selling your business. And even though you're getting a royalty piece, that's like a subscription model. That's actually one of the ways that you pick up a high valuation. For example, if I am a, if I'm a kid or an adult and I decide to mow lawns and I sell a hundred neighborhood neighbors on, I'm going to be your lawnmower. And then it's all of a sudden I'm like, wow, I'm bringing in $80,000 a year mowing lawns. If you want to sell that company, it's not worth $800,000. It's not worth $8 million. It's probably going to be worth one to two multiples of its, of its revenue at best, which means you're going to sell that $80,000 company that the 80,000 of gross it produces in a year. You're probably going to get 50 to a hundred grand for that company, right? So that's not exciting. There's no innovation. There's no technology. There's no moat, meaning nothing around it that makes it really special. Um, when you take your company and you successfully franchise it and you have multiple people growing it at once, um, that begins building a moat because very few people do that. And then if those people are having success and royalties are coming back to you, that subscription money is usually how you get awarded the highest multiples. So depending on how much revenue is there and how good your EBITDA is, they might look at that and say, Oh, you want to sell the corporate, you know, the corporate brand that, that has all these franchises out there. That's worth a lot of money to us because all we see is reoccurring revenue and we see it trending on the rise and we see that you can sell more franchises. And so we have a vision of we might give you a 10 X or a 20 X or a 30 X multiple on your EBITDA. And you're like, well, my EBITDA is 5 million a year. You add a, you know, you multiply that by 20. Now that's a hundred million dollar company. How did that happen? Franchise turns out is not just a great strategy for, for iteration and growth. It's a great strategy for exit too. Yeah, it, it, it really is. That, that blew my mind learning about some of those companies that have sold for over a hundred million. Now I want to, I want to talk about a little bit about 
some of the franchises you're involved in in a second. But I think here would be an interesting kind of part of the conversation to have, which is that, you know, people look at someone like you, you know, maybe they're, you know, following you on, you know, Instagram or YouTube. I mean, you have what a couple million people that follow you between all your platforms. Yeah. And they see you flying on private jets and making all this cool stuff and talking about, you know, the billions of dollars of transactions that you've done. And then maybe they start to feel discouraged because mm-hmm. they go, man, I can, I mean, Chris is so smooth. He talks so well. He, yeah. he spouts these stats off so easily. So, uh, you know, for me, when I was struggling with my trying to get my first business win, what really helped me was to learn about people's struggles, like seeing yeah. someone like you and sharing like, you know, this was the one time where it didn't quite go well and here's how yeah. I handled it. So would you be willing to share like one um, failure, a really tough time in business and how you overcame it? Well, let, let's actually just start with the whole wasted first decade of entrepreneurship, right? <laughs> like after I had my first 25 homes and that next year I went to 50 homes and then I went to a hundred homes, I was scaling my real estate but I started leveraging the wrong model and I started selling like on my original portfolio, I owned 50% of every house that investors would put up the money for. So for them, this was a passive play. The unique selling proposition was they wanted to invest in real estate because they knew that 90% of millionaires made their money in real estate, but they didn't want to pick up another job. They had a career. And I came in and I said, well, you've got 401k money that's not really doing anything for you. It's earning single digits. You have same thing with your IRA. Even the equity in your home is doing the same thing. I said, pull some of that out and let me put it into real estate and I'll do 100% of the work. And this is what the partnership is. You supply the money, I supply the work and we'll split profits 50-50. And people really like that. And I did that for my first 100 homes and it was working amazing. And then I formed a business partnership that convinced me that I should sell this as a service, not as a partnership. And I spent the rest of the decade transacting thousands of properties that I had no ownership in. The people came to me by way of my personality. And my partner also said, we don't want to brand you. We want to brand the business. We want to make this, this company exitable. And I basically followed him, um, you know, for a decade and at the end of the decade, I basically gave up the entire business for a buck to get out of it. And What I gained, what I had was a lot of life experience. What I had was a lot that I had done right. And, um, you know, after 2008, within the first five years, my investors cleared over a hundred million dollars in profits and I got none of that. And so there was painful lessons in my original model, what I gave up to be in a partnership, what I learned from that partnership. And, um, so I look at that first decade and I basically really walked away with nothing except for a lot of lessons. And one of the things that I did learn was that you have to value the lesson more than the money. Because if you really learn the lessons, this is unfortunately in entrepreneurship where a lot of us get stuck is we experience failure and we don't know how to process that. We beat up on ourselves and we tell ourselves, well, I'm not a naturally born entrepreneur and I'm not made for this and others are better at this. And look at Chris and look at the others. They figured it out. I want to be really clear. I was a, I was a full on F up for the first decade. Like I didn't know how to read financials. I didn't know how to look at the accounting and like turn that into any type of really solid decision-making. There were aspects of the business that I just full on ignored. I would, I really liked the rain making. I really liked driving revenue and I really liked building systems. And then I was ignoring some of the business and that made me a very, very weak business owner. And that first decade, I kind of walked away with nothing. But five years after that, I was able to do more in the next five years than really not just the last 10 years, but what it could have felt like the last 100 years, right? Um, and that's because I learned my lessons. And so um, there was definitely some pain along the way. I remember borrowing a borrowing million dollars once from this Jewish Iranian man on this deal. I was buying real estate at a 93% discount. I thought there's no way you can buy real estate and lose money if you're picking it up after 08 with a 93% discount. And let me tell you, you can lose money on 93% discounts after <laughs> when you go national for the first time. And I remember when I finally scrimped and saved everything I could to pay back that million dollars. I mean, dude, scariest day in my life. I probably shouldn't even share it. Scariest day in my life was this dude would call me up. He had this really deep voice. He's like, Chris, I need my money. You know, he was telling me about his Jewish Iranian heritage and how serious he was about never losing money. And I, I felt like, I felt like my life was being threatened. Just earlier, I'd been in Hawaii with my family trying to enjoy vacation. 
And he would call me every day. And I was so miserable on this trip. Well, after I got back, I'm sitting in my office one day and this black Escalade pulls up and four dudes in black suits and suitcases get out. And my mind is thinking, this is it. There are guns in those suitcases and the Jewish Iranian man has come to collect his debts in the form of my blood. And I kid you not, I was on my hands and knees with my head poking out the door as I was listening all the way down the hall to the reception desk at what they wanted. And it turns out that it was just a random group of people there to sell business suits. <laughs> and in that moment, I'm like, oh, like this is the worst stress I've ever felt in my life. And so, yeah, you want to talk about my mess ups, my first decade, um, I did not have enough mentorship. I didn't have someone showing me the ropes. I also didn't have someone saying, hello, ding dong, you know, franchise is going to be literally a hundred times easier than what it is you're trying to do, building stuff from scratch and not always getting the best advice. Um, so yeah, I mean, that first decade, I honestly could have thrown in the towel. I could have given up. Why, why, quit. why, you know, why didn't you? I mean, it's, it's so, it's so easy to just give up and kind of let it, let it yeah. go. Why, why do you think, why were you so resilient? Um, so there was a couple of reasons. Number one, I was even then an avid consumer of personal development. I was in masterminds. I was in, uh, all sorts of different programs, taking courses and, and an avid reader, uh, usually reading, you know, one, two or three books every single month. And I was either reading business books where I was reading books on just personal, you know, on mindset, personal development, positive mental attitude, you know, the law of attraction, all of these kind of ideas. And I saw a connection between the energy inside my head and my positivity and the results I was producing. So even when everything went back to zero, I felt liberated, I felt free and I felt excited and I felt excited to do things differently. What I did was figure out where I had failed as a business owner. I figured out uh, what I was unwilling to learn, which was basically accounting. And I'm not talking about going back to school and getting an accounting degree. I basically signed up for a four-day program and sat with Keith Cunningham for four days and had him teach me how to read financials. Mm -hmm. And after that four days, I finished plugging in every last gap that I was missing. Social media took off and I took off and everything has never been the same since. So you know, as an entrepreneur, the reality is I believe every entrepreneur has to go through a journey of school of hard knocks. Uh, that journey is short. If you have a great mentor and you're doing a lot of reading and learning and it's long, if you're like most people, I'm a lone wolf. I'm going to do this all by myself. Yeah. It's, it's amazing the role that's, that personal development plays. I mean, for, for years, I, I read the book, the secret when I was, I think right when I graduated high school and then get, just got immersed in that world, started listening to Tony Robbins and, yeah. It was at a stage in my life where, man, I was starting to hang around with the wrong people, do the yeah. wrong things. Yeah. You know, God was looking after me where every time they would get in trouble, I just, it was just the time where I just so happened to not be there. But what, you know, without that fin foundation, I, I yeah, I, I, it's scary to think of where, where I'd be. So in, let's talk about your franchise portfolio. So what, what does that, what does that look like? How, uh, are you a franchisor or are you a franchisee and, and yes. what brands? Yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> so for me, um, one of my, one of my unique propositions in the world is I've now built a, a really strong list of entrepreneurs that are looking for opportunities. And so it's my job to either create them, but more importantly, find them. And I'll tell you kind of to answer your question, I can take a little bit of the long way around the way I used to do things was called start from scratch. And the benefit of starting from scratch is whatever you build, you own 100% of. And I remember when one of my mentors, Dolph DeRue said, Chris, you can have a slice of watermelon or the entire grape. And I got his meaning. A slice of watermelon is a lot bigger than a singular grape. And so mm. because I had a partnership that had some hard lessons, I had been soured for a, for a minute and basically said, I, I should never give up equity. And when I finally had the pendulum swing from one direction of giving way too much, the other direction of never give anything up, when I landed square in the middle, I found the real strength in business. I'm an alchemist. Think for just a moment of Henry Ford, the dude that brought about the modern uh, automobile and wanted to bring it to all Americans. Did he know anything about fabricating a car? No. Did he know how to build a combustible engine? 
He did not. Did he understand sales and marketing of the, th of the vehicle? He did not. He was the visionary. He was a modern day, if you will, Sir Richard Branson, who basically has three steps to how you grow a company. Number one is have a vision for the value that you want to create in the world. Number two, find the most amazing people that carry out that vision. And number three, get out of their way. That's what Henry Ford did. He basically put the smartest people in a room and he said, I'm going to make sure I'm the dumbest person here. I'm just the visionary. And I'm going to let you smart, fine folks figure this game out. Well, that's alchemy. That's, that's combining resources. And so when you look at most of my business structures today, there's a handful of businesses that I own 100% of. And in most cases, I don't. And the reason why is if you want to own everything, then you have to bring everything. And a human brain only has so much to bring. You can't build an empire if you're bringing everything to the table because you're like here for this one lifetime. There's no, there's, you, you can't aggregate enough knowledge. You can't hit that many home runs. And so often what I do is I recognize my strengths that I bring to a business. I bring infrastructure, SOPs, accounting models, growth methodologies, leadership trainings. So basically how to grow a business, including culture. And what I do is I find someone that had invented the widget, someone that created the secret sauce, someone that's put their life's work into that. And I combine my resources with them. And for the ease of conversation, we'll call it a 50-50 arrangement. When we combine our resources, we are way better off together than we would be apart. So I'll give you an example of just one that I'm starting right now. Um, there's a There's a brand new company that's hitting the market called Elevate, Elevate Pools. Now, in a typical franchise, let's call it like a food franchise. Um, you've got to sell like freak, like 30,000 sandwiches a month, right? Like if you want to make money, you're going to sell your SKU a billion times that year. And you're, you're picking up pennies and dollars and it all aggregates to making money. Well, there's franchises that also operate on the other extreme. Um, and what this is, is um, I'm doing a 25,000 square foot addition on my home right now. And I've got this indoor pool that I'm putting in with this, this innovator. And what he did is he created a company. He's this nautical engineer. And he said, Chris, all of the fun things you go to theme parks for like wave pools and um, surf pools, like where you can surf on the water or even pools that literally have hydraulics where you can make the pool disappear. He says, I put those in residential homes. And so it's called elevate pools. I'm putting a pool in literally that you hit a button and it's a 10 foot adjustable depth pool with many levels and the pool literally disappears. It doesn't exist. You can have splash pads and all sorts of fun things with it. And so this, um, what's cool is that these pools can cost a couple hundred grand, but they've got add-ons where it could literally be a one and a half million dollar pool. And um, for a very basic four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars $500,000 pool that works this way, Someone who's familiar with construction, a franchise owner in this space, they could put in five pools a year and make a million bucks. And so that's an example of a unique franchise that basically says, we're doing this many units a year to make a million. Count one, two, three, four, five. That's it. And just by doing five jobs, we make a million dollars. You do 20 jobs, you're going to make millions of dollars, right? So that's, that's, um, in the franchise space, I look for things that are unique and novel and different. And, um, one of my rules about business is that if you don't have traffic, you don't have an idea. No matter how good a concept is, traffic determines whether it's good or not. So, um, his, he basically on, on three different channels had his pool placed. And oh my gosh, that is social media a bowl. He was getting 20, 30 million views. Wow. Because, the, because there's only one competitor in the world. They're in London. And so I'm like, okay, so this business, he's got one competitor. They've got business flowing out their ears. He did three social media posts with one pool that had just come out. They were awful social media, by the way. Like it wasn't made well or anything and had like 30 million collected posts. I'm like, okay, I know that I, like if I sell a hundred franchises for a hundred territories in the United States, like we as a corporation can do the marketing socially and win jobs for all these people and make this a... Uh, you know, for the right kind of franchisor, um, you, you know, franchisee, this is going to be a home run business. Uh, so I bring that one up because that one is novel and it's different. Um, and that one has not been launched yet, but I, I like its uniqueness. Um, I like that mm. it's different than often what you think about rather than like a donut shop. Yeah, much, much different. I know every, it's crazy how everyone wants food. It's, it's cause it's because of what they know. And I, you know, I got caught in that too. I wind up owning uh, juice and smoothie franchises. And, um, but one of the things that I learned, I didn't know what I didn't know was that 
food is one of the lowest profit margin businesses that that really exist out there. And there's so there's just so many other so many other options. So what? So okay, we got Elevate Pools that you're launching as a franchisor. Yep. And then what? What else out there in the franchise space? Uh, here's another very very different one. Um, I had for about a decade an MLM in real estate. It was multi level setup, and we transacted about fifty million dollars worth of business with it. Uh, but we could never get it to take off the MLM level of momentum that you hope for because it was mm. just the duck quacked so differently. And so we ended up shutting that one down. That was a disappointment. Um, there's a version of it that I'm now bringing back at a franchise level as a different strategy. And I've been running a pre-franchise um, strategy with 10, with 20 pilot program owners and so what I do sometimes with the franchise is before I franchise, I'll actually set up individual partnerships where we're not sharing the brand. And what it does is it allows me to collect for the FDDs. It allows me to collect a lot of data and information. So about two months, yeah, about two months ago, I started that one in development and we are starting to get that one's designed to also produce a half a million to a million dollars plus a year to the business owner. It's currently set up as just a very basic 80-20 split, 80% them. We give them the, the system, the software, the tools. And what they're doing is uh, the, the business is called Property. And Property is a real estate business that teaches wholesaling combined with buy and hold. Uh, mm. For those that don't know, wholesaling is this is where we use a lot of automation systems, data purchasing to basically find really, really great real estate deals in the market from people that are distressed that need to sell them, but they don't have the budget to fix them up. We have a system that automatically finds these homes and we've got um, out of country teams that phone call and query them to make sure they're really good deals. And then we turn it over to our business owners and they basically negotiate to purchase the house at a really good deal. And what they'll then do is flip it to a flipper. They'll flip the contract without ever buying it, without using money, without using credit, without putting anything into the business. They'll flip it to somebody. And on the low end, they'll make $20,000 per deal. And on the higher end, they can make over 100000 And so we're piloting that program out. It's working very well so far. And which, I would, which I would imagine, yeah, would work because you got the... Uh you know, the back in the day, the we buy ugly houses, which yes. most people probably don't know and didn't know that yes. that's actually a franchise system. Good yes. luck trying to get a territory with yes. them though. Yes. Right. Yeah. hundred percent. So what we did is we then said, okay, that exists, but it doesn't exist with this level of technology and automation because we've automated about 90% of the process. So there's people making over a million dollars a year doing this, but it's all manual. And so we're basically innovating the ease at which they can do the business. And then we're combining it with buy and hold because mm. normally in real estate, there's a debate between flip or hold. And we said, well, in our system, do both. And they're both, you know, we're doing it. Part of the test pilot is to see if we can make it a hundred percent autopilot. Cause I've done that with the buy and hold. And if I can actually go from 90% automated to hundred percent automated, then, you know, this will, will sell out 1000 franchises very, very quickly, probably in less than three years. And that business is projected to have a $47 billion valuation. So that's a space I know really well. What I did is I partnered with someone and I want to bring back to this, this game of partnering. I partnered with someone that my experience is in billions on buy and hold and his experience is in over a billion on flipping. So we're combining those two technologies together, bringing the automation and bringing a lot of done for you energy. And that's, um, that's in development. That one is also pre-launch. Uh, so it's, that one's not out yet. Amazing. I love it. <clears throat> so uh, in a minute, I want to hit on partnering, right? Yeah. Because I, I feel like that's a, that's probably a wound and maybe a scary topic for, yeah. for a lot of people. Yeah. Um, but uh, before we do that, is there is there a franchise that you own in the health space? Yeah. So Pure Life is a, is a franchise that is out there in a really big way right now. Like it's We've moved, I think we've got 30 or 40 locations just this last year that are currently being built out on it. Yeah. And are you the franchisee or franchisor or both? So on, on this one, I'm actually partnered up on the ownership team of it on the corporate side. So uh, what, I'm, what I'm doing from there is um, that one's exciting. And then there's also another one called Melty. And that is a sandwich shop. But that one has been blowing up and also doing really, really, really well. They just figured out a really cool recipe system on their sandwiches. 
And that one is a food one, uh, but it's been actually going really, really well. And that one's been selling like hotcakes too. It's, it's very familiar to people. It's very, very basic and elemental to get started, but you can kind of see, Hey, here's food. Here's health. Here's real estate. Here's construction. And, um, really one of my business strategies is I, I love the diversification game for my, for my portfolio. So our team have looked into a few hundred franchises and put together a list of five low cost franchises that all make $1 million or more and that have a proven track record of both happy and profitable franchisees. So if you have a net worth of at least $150,000 and you wanna see if the territory that you want is still available for any of these franchises, then you can go to franchiseempire.com forward slash check territory. All right, let's get back to the episode. Yeah, yeah, it's awesome. And it, and it makes me think there's so many great people that are great operators, right? Like you're a visionary and so your strength is as a visionary, but there are a lot of people that are wired. I don't want to say opposite because it's, it's not opposite, but they're wired as operators and yeah. maybe the way that they go out and make money in franchising is, hey, let me let me operate the franchise the at the at the franchisor level get some sort of equity stake or something like that and you know that could you know that could be an opportunity because i would imagine for all of those businesses you either have or will need an operator who will actually run the business yep and i actually love finding operators i think that being an operator is a very important part of an entrepreneur's journey. And I don't think it's something that should be skipped. I think you should know how to manage people and manage teams and, and understand it well enough so that when you graduate beyond it, there's an appreciation for how sensitive that it can be because you can have an operation working really well. And then all of a sudden you have, you bring someone in with, um, with a negative mindset. And within six months, they're losing employees left and right. They've lost the respect of people. They're, uh, you know, when you have a manager or someone who's in charge that doesn't have the respect of their employees, that's a really great way to tank a business. And 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 that's all it took was a bad attitude. Bad attitude broke my business, you know. And then um, you know, KPIs is like, oh, I didn't have my key performance indicators. I didn't know every day what every member of the team was supposed to do, and I wasn't checking them every day. So um, you know, that was the way that we got tanked. And so being an operator for a stint is a great opportunity to really say, Hey, I do need to understand what it looks like on the ground floor. If I ever want to graduate to chairman of the board that basically gets to provide advice from the top down as an owner to my operators that are running everything. Yeah. So, so I want to talk about partnering now, but, mm -hmm. but after that, what I want to talk about is your, your schedule. Cause it's very unique and people are probably thinking you work, you know, 70, 80 hours a week with all that you've got going on. But so in terms of partnering and, you know, negotiating equity, finding a partner, all these different things that you have going on with your businesses, what would you say are the, the, the top kind of do's and don'ts in terms of finding a partner, how yeah. you structure, <laughs> you know, the deal and the arrangement? Yeah. So I, I would, I would share a couple of these ideas first. The first one is if you're inclined to do everything alone, you'll have your slowest journey ever. Mm. If you are too eager to partner with people and you partner with the wrong people, then you won't have a slow journey. You will have a move backwards journey. And when you learn the proper dynamics of when to partner and when to not partner, that is when you can really hit a stride of maximum acceleration. So um, if you look at everything required for business, you know, when you own a business, I always ask people to pause and say, hey, don't just throw equity out there. Don't just automatically gravitate to a partnership. When you're trying to incentivize your people that that are bringing work to the table or maybe some innovation, you give them a salary. You can give them a salary plus bonus. If they need more than that, don't give them equity, give them salary bonus and maybe some type of revenue or profit share, right? And that should suffice for almost all situations. When you elevate to a partner, that's because they bring something that you are not bringing to the table that is necessary for winning. Mm. They're bringing something. And I mean, this is not a hireable person. This is not a hireable attribute. This is quintessential to the function and success of the business. For example, a lot of like every day, I've got a dozen emails in my inbox with people bringing me their business ideas and they're hoping that I'll partner with them. And they know this about me. They know that with five, 10 million organic social media views every week, 
that I have a crowd of entrepreneurs, a crowd of um, operators. Uh, they know that I can, I can move the needle on selling franchises like crazy. So I need to be very picky and choosy. And so I get hit up. So I've got a professional team and all they do is evaluate these people. And, um, you know, every month they probably kick up 10 consult for equity deals where I basically tell them, Hey, I don't want to be your partner, but I'll come in at a small level and I'll provide a lot of my tools and resources to help you grow. One in every 10, one in every 20 of those companies ends up being the company that I want to partner with. And that's because they look at me and they say, our business needs marketing, AKA Chris. And what they're bringing is something, an expertise in a game that I don't understand. And when you put the two of them together, you get magic. So I'm looking always for new partnerships. It's the only way I'm going to get to 10,000 companies. And so I'm clear on what I bring. I know I'm also clear on what I'm, I'm looking for someone to have brought some incredible next level innovation or disruption to the marketplace that doesn't exist. The last deal that I did probably has the greatest disruption that will be felt all around the world. And it's going to change the entire retail industry. Well, I was able and fortunate to partner up on that deal because of what I was able to bring to that table. So partnering is not for incentivized employees to do a good job. That's what profit share at best is or simple bonus structures. Partnership is when you are amalgamating a business and you have elements that you can't bring to the table. And those are the people that when you find them that you're offering equity to. Yeah, it's very interesting. You, you see these days a lot of companies that, uh, that have two founders. Right. And it's, it's like they complement each other yeah. really, really well in, in their skill sets. I'm seeing it more often, or, or you'll see yeah. husband and wives in businesses that really crush it. Yeah. And one has this skill set over the other. So it, it's, it's fascinating to me how you've, over your career, yeah. you've used this partnership. In the beginning, you did it with financing. You were saying you were raising capital, right? And then partnering, partnering on the real estate deals. And, uh, there could be people listening right now where they're they're thinking, man, I, I know I have the chops. I know I can do it. I just don't have the capital. I just yeah. don't have the money, yeah. right? Or, you know, I have the money, but I like what I'm doing and I don't want to get involved yes. in running the day-to-day -day no, of, yeah. of this other business. So how do you, outside of, outside of your brand, yeah. are there other ways that you, you know, find deals or people are pretty much just, coming to you and these opportunities, I don't want to say fall in your lap because you worked hard to build your brand, but fall in your lap. <laughs> yeah. Well, I want to be, I want to be really clear. Like there's definitely a strategy that's brought me to this moment. Um, you know, and, and that game of social media, I, anyone that you know, that has a social media empire, what they had to bring to the table was a novel, unique voice where value could be created across that platform. You know, I'm not mm -hmm. talking about someone that plays video games because there's only so much value that they can create in the world or someone that's really good at putting together funny cat videos. Um, you know, when you step into the space of being an influencer and you're providing practical knowledge and training, mentorship and skills, you're not going to get, you know, a crazy large following. That's actually one of the smaller, you know, knowledge base is actually one of the smaller brand sizes that you, that you're actually going to build out there. But you can build an incredibly loyal group of people that love learning and watching from you. And these are the people that as over the years go and they educate and learn from you that if they get the opportunity, if you resonate with them, they're looking at doing things with you. And that kind of leads me to another really important point, which is when you partner with people or you observe, Tarek, that there's people out there that, uh, hey, founders come in pairs of twos or whatnot. What, what's that all about? Here's my caution. For me, and I might be doing this wrong. It's right for me. I don't know if it's really great advice for everybody else, but I'm very careful at a private and personal level who I partner with. Meaning, do mm -hmm. I like you? Do I, do I align with your morals and values? Um, would I break bread with you? And I'll tell you that partnerships that have gone bad is when there is a difference in value structure. And I'm not mm -hmm. talking about one person being good and one person being bad. I mean that there's a million ways humans can be and I need to really resonate heart and soul with someone. And so my partners are also some of my favorite people on the planet. And there's a correlation with that because we'd like to believe that money doesn't change people. But let me tell you something. When you add enough zeros to success, money magnifies people. So for example, if there's someone that you kind of have pet peeves and issues with when there's not a lot of money, when there's a lot of money, those issues are going to grow. And so you it may grow to a point where you can't stand them. And now something beautiful is at risk and gets lost. So 
for me, the most important part of partnerships is not, are you competent? Not like, can you do it? That's important. That's a must. That's, that's not what I'm looking for though. That's a given. I want to know if we can dance. Like, do we like each other at a human level? Can we hang out? Can we play, talk, have fun, connect? Uh, because if it's just competency, I can't tell you how many competent people ruin business. There has to be some type of deeper value alignment, character alignment above all, which ruins, by the way, a lot of deals. I walk from a lot of money because I believe they're never going to turn into anything anyway, because when those values don't meet and the business starts succeeding, it's going to be chaos. You know, that, that, that is, that is pure gold that you said that. And I, I recently had an opportunity that in a similar a situation that happened to myself where I really liked the business, I really wanted to get involved, but I just, I just did not like the owner and he just rubbed me the wrong way. And I kept trying to force myself to kind of get there. And then ultimately, I, actually, my wife and I were just having this conversation in the car the other day. And I'm like, I can't. There's no way. I don't like him. <laughs> I don't like him. If there's resistance or if there's friction, that's always my warning sign that it's not going to work out because a little friction today with success is a lot of friction tomorrow. So mm. if there's any friction, I'm out. Yeah. Okay. So before we hit on your schedule to to close on that, um, so what people may not see from this camera angle is that you are jacked. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you are you are. <laughs> so um, you know, and I love to run Spartan races. Mm. So right now I'm training for a Spartan Beast, a thirteen. Uh, that a beast. 13 Those are mile. amazing. I love them. You've done it. Yeah. Yeah. Hundred percent. Man. So, so what, you know, I know what role for me that fitness and health and just pushing myself to the brink of mental and physical failure, what, how that's impacted me. But I'm curious for you, like, why do you train for bodybuilding competitions and how has that impacted your ability to not just produce money and at a business level, but what has that done for you as an individual, as a father, as a husband? So there's a, there's a saying how we do some things is how we do all things. And if you back out of business, uh, I can't tell you how many men in particular I meet that are so out of balance, racing to get even more out of balance. There's this idea that if I work hard enough and if I make enough money or if I feel significant enough or smart enough or successful enough, that everything in my life will get better. But that's actually not true. Um, you know, I, I break life down in four very simple ways. There is the physical health part of our life. There's the relationship part of our life. There's the wealth part of our life. And there's the spiritual part of our life. Bring any one of the four out of balance and they will threaten what you believe to be in balance. So for me, um, every single day before 9 a.m., I've done something for my relationships, for my spiritual well-being, for my health, and for my finances. And um, that routine starts at 4 a.m. for me and ends at 9 a.m. Now, most people, their day, their work day starts at 9 a.m. Uh, if nothing else happens after 9 a.m., I go to bed a very fulfilled man. Because for me, I've brought balance to these four areas. There must be tangible growth in all four areas every day to, to grow in balance. Because when you finally hit an achievement, I know what this is like to hit an achievement and still feel unfulfilled. And it's because we ignored things that we shouldn't have ignored in the pursuit of something else. This is very common in today's world. So I get up at four and the first thing I do is I nurture my mind. I listen to a book for 40 minutes. Then I'm at my private gym and me and my wife are both, we do this whole routine together. We're side by side on the treadmill and we're now meditating. This is an active meditation out loud. We've got our headphones in, one ear off talking to each other. This is an out loud meditation. It's a very spiritual process. And we have... Um, during these 40 minutes, some of the most beautiful conversations and private experiences that we're sharing with each other. So our minds been nurtured, our spirits and our heart emotions have been nurtured. Then we are with our buddies at the gym and we're training always for a physique or a bikini competition in her case. We've got another one in 2024. That'll be my fifth one. Um, and uh, right now I'm in the process of adding 25 pounds to my body. So I'm, I'm almost 250 pounds. I'm trying to get to 270 pounds. So I'm trying to put wow. on as much weight as I possibly can this year. And, um, and so I'm working out hard with my buddies and with my coach. And then afterwards I've got an hour in the morning with my wife. It's just her and me time. Sometimes we do more meditation. Sometimes it's sexual. Sometimes it's energetic, but we're having conversations that's furthering us. And then that last hour of the day is for our children. 
Because the last thing an entrepreneur wants is to look back and say, I was a sucky father or mother. I, I neglected what was important. And so that hour is about breakfast all together. My children are all privately educated in my home with teachers that come in. That's part of our co-creation of success because um, I want them all to be there for that for that hour, especially at the start of the day where we talk about life's lessons, where we talk about God, or we talk about how to be successful in life. And so by 9 a.m., everything that I needed to check off my list that was critical to being a successful father, husband, um, employer, um, and, and child of God, all of that's done by 9 a.m. And uh, that balance is more important than any win that, that I could ever have in life. Mm, amen. Yeah. So yeah, one, 100%. So let's, cl- let's close on this, which is, so are you, are you working 60, 70, 80 hours a week? How does, how does, how does that play out with all, all these things that you got going on? So four years ago, a little over four years ago, I had, um, one of my, my one of my best friends die and he, uh, he, he caught some bad wind in his paraglider and fell from the sky, um, several hundred feet hit the mountain. And, um, it was awful. He was one of the world's top 100 YouTubers. His name was Grant Thompson, um, and an, an incredible human being, a father of a um, you know, beautiful wife and four amazing boys. Um, and um, after he died, I thought to myself, you know, if I were, if I were dead like Grant, I would feel very unfulfilled. Why is that? I'm I'm so I'm so financially successful. Why why have I not given myself permission to create my perfect life today? What am I chasing? And so I basically redid my entire schedule and it hasn't changed in four years. And I basically built my utopia, my perfect life. And that's what I've been living. So uh, Mondays um, is a work day for me. And that's where I do all my social media. Tuesdays and Thursdays, I work from home. Wednesday is my day with my wife. And we spend the whole day together. We'll take our jet and go do Disney for a day or we'll hit the spa it doesn't matter as long as we're together and connecting because she's my best friend and I want to have that day with her. Uh, Friday is my kid's day. Saturday is my day. Sunday is God's day. And the evenings, um, barring an occasional event that I put on or webinar, the evenings are otherwise 100% always free. So my morning routine is always protected. My evenings are always protected. My day is broken out that way. So I end up working 25, maybe worst, you know, 30 hours a week. And that provides balance for me in every area of my life where I get to explore life on my terms the way that I want to. And to any entrepreneur listening out there, we are either making money for something materialistic. We want to have something. Or we want to make money so that we can, so that we can save it and squirrel it away. And both of these things, I believe, will bring you sadness. Mm. What you really want is to use money for creating life's most perfect memories, for living a life well-lived, living a life where you got to do everything that you really wanted to. That means that my money goes towards three things. It's never for savings. It's either for investing because the more my money works for me, the less I have to work out of obligation until one day you just don't have to anymore. I don't have to work. I do because I love it and it's part of fulfillment. The second thing I use money for is delegation. I hire people to do everything I don't like. If I don't like it, I don't do it. I don't cook. I don't clean. I don't organize. I'm not a chauffeur. I don't drive people around. I'm driven wherever I go. So money is, is for investing. Money is for everything I don't want to do. And then number three, money is for creating life's most precious memories. And um, those three things um, have allowed resources to be divvied up and spent in a way that uh, gives me this beautiful lifestyle. Amazing. Awesome, Chris. Thanks so much uh, for coming on today. Loved uh, loved hearing about your story. And we'll we'll drop some links in the descriptions and add some stuff throughout the episode. I know you have a, a gift for everyone yep. if they go to f- what freewealthgift.com forward slash empire. Yep. Forward slash empire. Yep. Okay. Awesome. Good stuff. All right, man. Chris, thanks for coming on. Yep. Appreciate you. Hey, before we go, thank you so much for listening to this episode. Please subscribe here on YouTube if you haven't already. And the biggest thank you that you could ever give me is to share this episode with someone who you think will benefit. Uh, That means that we can share this message with more people and hopefully positively inspire them like we have you. So thank you. And until next time, go build your empire.